good. So we'll record it. And I think it is, yeah, it's recording. Okay, so um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna review uh, assembly language programming uh, with an eye towards the uh, programming test that was originally scheduled for Tuesday, but, uh, but I, I'll, I'll set it up for Thursday instead next week. Um, so that will be on the 25th, I don't know, let me see, I forget. Uh, on the 25th, yeah, 25th of February. Okay, so, um, so let me just review uh, how the instructions work and kind of the overall organization of the chip. So, uh, so I'm going to go to a few of the slides and see if I can get those pulled up. Um, so these are uh, compiler directives. Okay, yeah, we'll come back to these then. Yeah, okay, so hang on a minute and then. Okay, so, so the first thing, I think I have a slide on here I want to show. Okay, so let me, uh, so let me, I'm going to put this over here. And we'll do this. And then we'll go to, uh, I'll share my screen. And actually I want window. Okay, can you see that okay? Yes. Okay, so. Yeah. So the first thing to keep in mind is this is the so when you when you write assembly language instructions, for the most part, you have to understand how the processor works. Otherwise, it makes no sense, and uh, and that's why I make you learn it because it forces you to learn how the processor works, which is really the underlying objective. I, I don't really care that you become proficient in assembly language programming because for the most part. At this point in time, we won't be doing any assembly language programming, really. Uh, there may be some snippets of code that will have to be written in assembly. Even, you know, this is true forever going forward. Uh, but for the most part, uh, our chips have, now have a big enough memory and they're fast enough that, that we can, and we have enough compilers that, that you can write things in a language like C. Uh, for, for the most part, C is still kind of the de facto standard for embedded systems. Uh, as far as, uh, as as far as an advanced language, probably someday we may, you know, that may be replaced by Python. I don't know. It'll be interesting to see, uh, and there may be other languages as time goes on. But but right now it's still C, and it, for the foreseeable future that will be true. So the so with an eye towards understanding how the actual processor works, let's let's look at this architecture. So here's the CPU in this little blue. Now, the CPU executes 14-bit instructions. All, every single instruction is 14 bits. And it gets it because it's a Harvard architecture. So it has a separate memory for the program, which is implemented in flash. So it's non-volatile, which means that, the, that whatever's stored there will stay there even when the chip is powered off. Once you flash a program in, it's there until you flash something else. Uh, or if you let the chip sit for, you know, something like 300 years, I guess it loses its uh, code, or something like that. I don't know. It's a long time. Maybe it's longer than that. But there is a there is a time where the program would slowly degrade after many 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 years. But for the, within any sort of foreseeable lifetime of a of of a you know of a chip, the uh, uh, the program is going to be there. So it's non volatile. All right. And every single location in this program memory, every address, and uh, it can have up to 32 uh, K addresses, which works out to be 56 8-bit bytes or 56,000 8-bit bytes. Every one of those 32 possible 32 K locations is 14 bits. That's why it's more bytes than it is instructions. It's almost two bytes per instruction, not quite. So in our particular case, uh, our memory is 8K for this chip. But chips in, there are chips in the family that have 32K. 
uh, but that's the maximum. You can't have any more than that because that's that the, the address bus for the program memory is 15 bits. And 15 bits will only get you 32K. If you want more than that, you have to add bits. 16 bits will get you 64K and so forth. But we only have 15 bits for the address bus in program memory. And the data bus going to program memory is 14 bits. So it's a wide data bus. And uh, every time you address a location of program memory, you're addressing 14 bits. And when you load that up, you're moving the 14-bit instruction into the program, uh, into the instruction register in the CPU. As a, as a programmer, even in assembly, I don't think we can get to the instruction register. It's, it's, it's a buried register. And it's there so that the CPU can load up an instruction. And it's actually more complicated than that because it is pipelined. So it's actually working on two instructions pretty much simultaneously. And, and when it's decoding one, it's fetching another and it's partly decoding that. So it's, so it's got, it's got you know, a couple of instructions loaded up. And whenever you branch, it has to flush that pipeline. And that's why a branch takes uh, two instruction cycles and not one instruction cycle. Uh, but anyway, so we have this 14-bit instruction in the, in the instruction register and the CPU uses that to tell it what to do. And so understanding how this 14-bit instruction is implemented is real important for understanding program, uh, writing assembly language programs. Okay, so we'll come back and look at that in just a minute. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, the, uh, there are also some other things that are in the hardware. Um, there are a total of 50, 49 different operation codes or 49 different instructions. So basically 50 instructions. Uh, you do have two 16-bit file select registers, which have to be addressed eight bits at a time with the FSS1 high and FSS1 low and FSS0 high and FSS0 low. So, and these are what are used for indirect addressing. We're, we're going to sort of just not use indirect addressing uh, uh, at least in our assembly language routines because we don't really have to get to that. Uh, it's a little bit confusing and probably not something we have to really understand at this point. But um, C uses these registers all the time. In fact, it, C exclusively, exclusively uses indirect addressing. Uh, and so it uses these, these registers. And then there are some shadow registers that when you, when you have an interrupt, uh, will take the information stored in, in all of the critical registers and save it in these shadow registers so that uh, you don't have to manually do that in your interrupt service routine. And, that, and then when you return from your interrupt service routine, all that information in those shadow registers is automatically restored to the regular registers so the program can pick up exactly where it left off when it got interrupted. And that way your interrupt service routine can use these registers to, in whatever way it chooses without, without having to first save them so that they can be restored later so you can pick up where you left off in the main routine. So that's a really nice feature. Uh, the return address for interrupts and functions is stored on a 16-level uh, stack. And, and uh, there's also a program counter there and some reset abilities and whatnot. All right. Now, the CPU runs on this internal oscillator module, which we, we will normally set on most of our programs, maybe even all of them, we'll set this at, at 4 megahertz. But you could set it up to as high as 32 megahertz. Uh, and th there's really no reason not to do that. We're just, I'm doing it for 4 megahertz just because it, it causes us to have one instruction every, uh, every one microsecond. So that's kind of a nice round number. And it works out that with our A to D converter, uh, it's, a, it's, the A to D converter is, uh, is restricted. It has, it has to do conversions at about one megahertz so with a one megahertz clock. So, so it makes the, <coughs> I don't know, there, there's several reasons. And also if we, if we do PWM with it, we can get our PWM, if, if we're using servos, we can get our PWM frequency down low enough that uh, we can make the servos work. And if you have a higher clock speed, then you, 
the, you can't really you, you you have problems getting the servos to work properly. You have to change the processor clock to use servos. I don't know. There are just several reasons why four megahertz is a nice round number to use. But again, it, it's not re absolutely required. And we, we could just as easily be using 32 megahertz for most of what we do. Or we could be using, you know, 500 kilohertz. Really doesn't matter. It just, but it's nice to have a fast processor. When we start doing uh, the touch sensing, so it's, it's nice to, to, you know, be able to cycle through a whole bunch of, uh, bunch of test buttons, uh, multiple times within a second. And so faster clock speeds help us do that. Uh, on the other side of the CPU, there, there's another uh, entirely different uh, data bus and address bus. And this is uh, the data memory. And the data memory includes our, our random access memory. We have static random access memory as opposed to dynamic random access memory. Uh, and then uh, the dynamic random, random access memory is what's used in, in our desktops and laptops. But this dynamic memory requires a lot of uh, hardware overhead to, to make it work because it has to be refreshed uh, every, every, uh, every few microseconds or it will actually lose its information. So we're continually refreshing our memory banks uh, in our laptops and desktops and there are special chips and circuitry to make that happen. But, but uh, but a micro doesn't do that. It uses static memory instead, which takes up more room, but um, per, you know, per byte or per bit. But uh, the payback is we don't have to have the, the refresh circuitry built in. And so if we don't have you know, gigabytes of, of static RAM uh, because we really can't fit that on a chip very easily and it's expensive. So we, we have limited static RAM. In our chip, we only have one megabyte uh, other chips in this family can have more than that. I forget what the max is. Maybe, I don't know, I, I, it's several megabytes. Uh, I'm sorry, several kilobytes. We have one kilobyte and we, you can have up to several kilobytes, but, um, but we just have one. All right. And, and then on this same bus over here, both the address and data bus, the data bus is eight bits wide. The address bus is 12 bits wide. So you have a 15 address bit address bus to the program memory, you have a 12 bit address bus to all the rest of the data memory and all the peripheral registers for all the modules uh, and your static RAM and your EEPROM and everything. So 12 bit address bus over here, 15 address bit address bus over here, eight bit data bus over here. So everything over here is eight bits and everything over here is 14 bits as far as the word size. So we just have uh, the, the words are bytes over here. The words are 14 bits over here. Okay, so, uh, so it's sort of important to understand that. Now, because we have 14 bit instructions, we, we uh, are 12 bits, if we, if we put, if when we address some memory location or some function register in one of the modules, if we used all 12 bits of the address in the instruction, there'd only be two bits left for, for everything else in that instruction. And there's several other things we would need besides just the destination or the, or the address that we wanna work with. We would need the operation code. Remember there are 49 instructions. If we only have two bits, all we could have is four instructions. So that would be a big problem. So, so we, we do not put all 12 bits of the address for anything entirely in the instruction. What we do is we put seven bits of the address when we address a register or a peripheral module register or whatever, or random access memory. We put 12 bits of the address in the instruction, but we have to make sure before we execute that instruction that five bits of the address are in the bank select register, the BSR. So that's why we have to do all these bank cell commands is to get the bank select register pointing to the right bank. And then our seven bits of address in the, the instruction will get to the right place. If the bank register is pointing to the wrong bank, the seven bits in the instruction don't know any better and we'll use whatever that seven bits address is in that bank. Now, in some cases that's okay because the first 12 registers are the same in every bank and the last 16 registers are the same in every bank. So if we're using one of the core registers, 
it, it, it won't matter what bank we're in. If we're using one of the 16 static random access memory locations that are the upper 16 of the first bank, then it won't matter either because they're mapped to every bank as well. But if we're using the general purpose registers other than those 16 high registers in the first bank, then it will matter what bank we're in. And if we're, if, if we're addressing a special function register in one of our modules, then it will definitely matter what bank we're in because they're all in different banks. So we do have to get the bank correct. Otherwise we get the wrong information. And unless of course we're using one of the core registers or one of the, uh, they call it general purpose RAM that's mapped to every bank. Okay, any questions about that? So how much of it do we have to know? Like everything or just like the basic idea? You, you don't have to know the numbers per se, but you need to know the basic idea. So you need to understand that, that, okay. that not all bits of the address are in, are in this, are, are in the 14 bit instruction. And it, you don't have to know it's seven bits of address, but you know, if you, it's would kind of not be nice to sort of, that might be one piece of information to be nice to know that there's, that there's a 12 bit address five bits in the BSR, seven in the instruction. But, uh, and you should know that the program memory is 14 bits, that all, that every instruction is a 14 bit instruction. Let's see, on one second here. Thank you. Hey Frank, I'm doing a Zoom thing, uh, help session with my class. Can, can I call you back in about uh, 45 minutes or so? Okay, I'll call you back. Thanks. Okay. Okay. So. Um, all right. So, so this. So it's important to have this basic picture and the EEPROM. Uh, I might add a lab to use the EEPROM. I, I haven't ever done one, but it is actually very useful. And what this EEPROM is, it's a, uh, it's 128 bytes, I think of non-volatile uh, read-only memory. It's electrically writable and electrically erasable. The flash is too, but the difference is here you can erase a single location and rewrite it. Here you have to erase, I think, I think you have to erase eight locations at once and rewrite all eight of them. So it's a little more of a pain to do that in program memory. And also it's 14 bits and you can really only use eight of the bits. So it's kind of wasteful. Whereas this is eight bits, just like everything else in the data memory. So if you want, if you have some data that you wanted to save, if, even if even after power off, like like say you made a game and you wanted to save high scores, unless the person specifically wanted to erase them, you could save high scores and then when they turn the device off, the high scores if you saved them in the EEPROM would still be there. Where if you if you put them in memory, as soon as you turn the device off, they're gone. So it's like if you were logging data, you might you might log, you know, temperatures for, you know, once a day for 128 days, you could put those temperatures, as long as you could fit them at eight bits, you could, you could put them into the EEPROM. If you need a 16 bits, then you can only do 64 of them, I guess, but so I'd get you a couple months. Anyway, so th this has some really useful features and it's something that's actually missing on some higher end uh, processors. The, uh, the KL25Z that we use in Micro 2 doesn't have any EEPROM so there's really not a lot you can do non-volatile. You have to put it in program memory. It's a bit of a hassle to do that uh, because it's again flash, and you have to, you know, you have to erase a bunch of values and then rewrite them all and change only the one you want to change. So it takes it's a little more of an involved process. Okay. All right. So with that in mind, uh, let me go back then. Let's see. So um, well, I wanted to talk about that. So. Um, yeah, four, four kilobytes of RAM is the max. We just have one. Okay, so, so the registers that we're gonna always use, so when you, when you write assembly language, you really kind of need to know the programmer's model. And, and those are the registers that are available to you. And that's, that's why you have to understand how the chip works because you're really dealing with the hardware. Whereas in C, when you write a C instruction, it looks exactly the same whether it's running on your laptop using the IA32 system, whether it's running on the KL25Z uh, using uh, an ARM core uh, thumb two language, 
or whether it's running on a PIC, 8-bit PIC, or a 16-bit PIC, or a 32-bit PIC, uh, all, using, all using different instructions, different compilers. But because the compilers take care of all the translation, you, you don't have to really know all that much about what's going on because uh, the compiler takes care of all the work for you. And that's why it's nice to use advanced higher level languages because it, it, it takes a lot of the work out of programming uh, for some things. Although there are a few things that are actually easier in assembler. Uh, but for sure, any, 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 any amount of mathematics is very difficult in assembly and much easier in C uh, as are complicated uh, decision trees and things like that. Okay, so if we look at the programmer's model, we have a W register, which is our working register. This is the general purpose register. In most micros, uh, we have a lot of these registers uh, called general purpose registers. Uh, like on the KL25Z, there are 13 of them. But in, on, on, the, on this low level or this mid-level pick, there's just one. And everything has to happen in this one 8-bit register. Uh, then we have the bank select register. Now, it is only five bits. It's only five bits because remember that in the instruction register, or in the 14-bit in the, in the instruction, if we address a location, seven bits are set aside for the address. The other five bits to get to the 12-bit address have to be in the bank select register. So five plus seven gives us the 12 bits. <coughs> and that's why we only have five bits, which means there, the maximum number of banks we can have is 32 banks. And if we, if we skip out of this for a minute, and uh, let's see, screen. Let me let me go back to the data sheet. Oh yeah, because I did the window. That's why it dropped out. Uh, let's see here. Let me share a screen again. So I'll, I'll, I'll share this. So um, during yeah, the test, would we have access to the data sheet or no? Yeah, yeah, it's open book. Okay. Yeah, yeah, everything's open book. Um, so, so here's the, so this is, uh, if we look at, if we go to, um, if we go to chapter 29, instruction set summary, there's a couple of things to see in this chapter that are really important. So the first thing is we have this little, on the first page, here it is. We have this little code here, code field description. So when we look at an instruction, there are certain, they use these letters and we kind of need to know what these stand for because at, at, that actually really helps you. So F stands for a register file address. That means a random, a static random access memory location of which we have a, uh, you know, 1,024 of these or one of our special function registers in one of our modules. Uh, and it also refers to sort of our core registers because they have addresses too. But, uh, but because they're all mapped into every bank, we don't have to worry about the BSR for them. Then W, whenever we see a W, then that refers to our one working register, sometimes called the accumulator. And then we have this little thing B that's, that's the bit address when we're dealing with an 8-bit file register. So um, what, what, that, what that B is, is a 3-bit value, 0 through 7. And it refers to one of the bits in this 8-bit register. Remembering that every register in the data, in the data side of the, of the memory is an 8-bit location. Now, you know, in, in some cases, not all eight bits are implemented like in the BSR, only five bits are implemented. If you write to bit seven, it doesn't do anything. Go ahead. Did you have a question? Oh, okay, yeah, if you do, just let me know. So anyway, so, so this B is a three bit value and, and you guys use that instruction like, uh, like your bit set F and bit clear F instructions you had a file register location, an F location, and then you had the second operand was the B, which said which bit in that in that eight bit location would you be uh, would would you be affecting? So if you're going to set a bit, the B could be zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, or seven, and then the file register could be, uh, you know, could be any any address in your special function registers 
your core registers are in any of the one, one K of random access memory locations that you have. Uh, then we have uh, this K, which is a literal field. Now the literal field can be as big as, uh, uh, it, it, it varies in size depending on the instruction. In, in the branch, in the go-to instruction, it can be, I think, up to 12 bits. Uh, but normally in, in the data instruction, it's gonna be typically eight bits. But if, but in some, but there are a couple of instructions like the BSR, like the, uh, the load, uh, load, um, like the, uh, yeah, like the load literal to BSR, that instruction, oh, the K is only five bits because there's only five bits in the BSR. Anyway, uh, and then we have this destination, this D. The D is a single bit. If it's a zero, it means store the result of whatever the instruction does in W. And if the D is a one, it means store the result in the file register. And so we'll see that. And then these, this N is, uh, has to do with whether you're using indirect register zero or one. And then there's also uh, pre and post increment and decrement and uh, stuff, which we're not gonna use, but that's, that's for the indirect addressing. Uh, you can do pre and post increment and decrements with those instructions. All right, so it's good to know we have a program counter. Uh, we have a timeout bit. That's the, uh, that's, uh, that's the watchdog timer. We have a carry bit, a digit carry bit, and a zero bit. These three bits here, these are, these are the, uh, uh, these are the, yeah, the, these three bits here are the, are the status register bits. Uh, well, and these are also, some of these are also in the status register, but in the status register, we can interrogate the zero bit, the carry bit and the digit carry. The digit carry is when we do a mathematical operation, basically just an add or subtract. And there's a carry from the lower four bits called the lower nibble to the upper four bits, the upper nibble. And this was implemented so that you could do binary coded decimal arithmetic uh, in assembly language. And this makes it a little bit easier to do it. Uh, we won't use that because we're not gonna do any BCD arithmetic anymore. If we need to do any arithmetic, we're gonna write the program in C because it's so much easier. All right, so armed with this information, now we can look at the instruction set. Uh, there are, there are uh, uh, just a few different instruction formats. Um, if we go down here, there's, there's some instructions where there's, there are no operands at all. There, it's just, just a, all 14 bits are opcode. Um, <coughs> there's some file select register increment instructions and uh, offsets and some other things. We're not gonna worry about these. Then we have a, a branch always instruction, the BRA. And here we have nine bits of, uh, of two's complement offset. And then if we have the go to, the call and go to, we have 11 bits of offset. I said 12, but it's actually 11. Uh, so there's really no reason. I don't know why they even have the BRA. They could easily get rid of this instruction. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, really, um, I don't know, it doesn't really work. Uh, but uh, I mean, it's, it's fine, but it's, but there's no reason to use it when, when you could use this one up here instead and it takes the same amount of time and everything. So, so, but if we had all, uh, all uh, 32K of our address space of, of our program memory used, uh, this 11 bits wouldn't get us there. We'd need 15 bits to jump to any location in that 32K space. So there are times when you might have to do two jumps to get to a location that was uh, that was you know maybe um, maybe 30k from where you you know from the instruction you're executing, and uh, so but it is two's complement, so you can go either directions. So that drops it down a little bit, but you still can't get to every instruction, and that's where that's where uh, again it's nice if you're in C because C takes care of that for you. If you're writing an assembly language routine that was really big and you wanted to jump from the beginning of your routine to the very end, and you had a chip that had all 32K of program memory implemented, you, you would not, you could use this instruction and it wouldn't work. Uh, you'd have problems with it. So, uh, all right. And then, then we have, but 
most of the instructions. So we have a bunch of these literal instructions, the bit oriented instructions, and the byte oriented instructions. And these are the ones you really have to know about. The rest of them are kind of special. This is, uh, this is the, uh, uh, this moves a value into the, uh, into the, uh, the, the program counter latch high, and that's all it does. This one moves moves five bits into the B, the bank select register. That's all it does. And uh, and then these are file select things for indirect addressing. And these opcode only are things like no op, um, reset, a couple of things like that. All right. So the ones we're really interested in are these byte oriented, bit oriented, and literal uh, and these literal. So the byte or the byte oriented we'll look at right now. Notice there's an opcode that goes from bit 13 to 8. So that's what? Uh, so 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Six bits of opcode. So you could have as many as um, you could have as many as 64 different uh, instructions like this. Um, but we don't have that many. Uh, and then there's a single D bit. And then there's seven bits of file address here. And that seven bits of file address is combined with the five bits in the BSR to get the 12 bit address in the data memory, which could include any, any place in your, in your random access memory or any of the special function registers in the various modules. So this D bit is either a one or a zero. And it tells you once you do this operation, where do you leave the result? Do you overwrite the file register? Or do you leave it in the W register? And there's multiple reasons for you know, why sometimes we'll do one and sometimes the other. If you don't specify by default, it's a one and it leaves it in this location, this file register location, augmented with the five bits in the BSR. Okay, here, this is the same, this is your bit clear F and bit set F instruction. It's also bit test F. Uh, uh, bit test F jump clear, bit test F jump set instructions. And you have a three bit value here that picks the bit you're gonna test or, or change. And then you have the seven bits of the file register or special function register address. And you have the opcode. And here the opcode only has what? 10, 11, 12, 13, only four bits. So there's at most 16 of these, but there's, I think there's not that many anyway. And then we have a handful of literals and we'll look at those. Okay, so let's go look at the byte oriented instructions. So here they are. We have, we have uh, add W to F. Now notice we have an F operand and a D operand. Remember that D operand is a single bit. All it does is choose between the file register that's selected here by F augmented by the five bits in the BSR. Again, seven bits here five in the BSR to give us a 12-bit address. And, uh, and the other option is the W register. So we can always leave all these instructions involve the W register. The W register is always used in these byte-oriented instructions with one exception, and that is the clear instruction. In the clear instruction, we have a, a, special, a special instruction for clear the W register. And that's an opcode only instruction. And we have a, well, I don't know, maybe it is a, I don't think it, yeah, it's gotta be opcode only. And we have a, uh, we have, and, and, it, and then the clear register instruction, we're gonna clear F and it doesn't matter. There's no, you don't, there's no way to leave the result in the W register because why would you clear F and then not clear it? That would make no sense. So it always leaves the result in F. And so you don't have a destination bit. And then the other one where you do not have a destination bit is when you move the value in the W register to, an, to a file register. And there's no destination because you obviously want to put it in the file register or you wouldn't do the instruction. It's already in W, so there'd be no reason to execute this instruction. Now, there is sort of a funny thing about the move F instruction. And the move F instruction takes the data from a file register F and puts it in the W, but you do have a destination bit for this instruction, which means 
you don't even have to put it in W. You can actually move F back to itself. Well, why would you want to do that? The reason you might want to do that is it will set the zero bit here. And when it sets that zero bit there, that will tell you if the location is zeroed out or if it has a value. So that is one way to test the location to see if it's zero or has a non-zero value. Um, and let's see. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so in this, in these byte-oriented instructions, we can take, we can add W to F. We can add W to F with the carry bit as well. The carry bit counts as a low order bit. So if you were doing a 16-bit add, you'd first do the low bytes with W with this instruction because you do, wouldn't want to use the carry bit. Although you could, but you'd have to clear it first. So you don't want to. So that would take an extra instruction. So you just do this add W to F, which uh, which is going to set the carry bit, the digit carry bit, and the Z bit. Uh, so when you add these, if there's no carry out, it'll put a zero in carry. And if there is a carry out, it'll put a one in carry. And then, then you could add the next byte with the carry bit. So whatever the bit was set at zero or one, it would add that into this next result and, and give you a proper 16 bit total result. <coughs> and then you could check the carry bit if, if you were doing unsigned addition, and that would tell you if you had an overflow from the second addition, you would always do the low byte first and then the high bytes. If you were doing two's complement, the carry bit doesn't mean anything. And now you have to compare the signs of the two add ends and make sure you don't have two positives getting a negative or two negatives getting a positive. If the two signs are different, you know it's fine. No carrot, no overflow. If they're the same, you have to check the answer to make sure it's the same. Otherwise you did have an overflow and the carry bit doesn't tell you anything. So you have to know whether you're doing a signed or an unsigned when you're do doing assembly language because the language doesn't keep track of it for you. But in C, you designate your variables as unsigned or signed and C handles all this for you. Then we can add, uh, then we can and W with F and it only affects the Z bit. We can arithmetically shift right and it affects carry and Z. So when you shift, you shift through carry. You shift, well, you shift, you shift the bits all to the right. You propagate the higher order bit. So you, if the higher bit's one, you shift in a one on the left side, and you shift out the right, the rightmost bit that just goes into carry. Then left shift, logical left and logical right. Uh, the logical left. Um, shifts zeros in the lower order bit and shifts the higher order bit into carry. The logical right shifts zeros into the higher order bit and shifts the right bit out into carry. And then clear F, clear W. Complement F inverts every bit. Decre decrement F subtracts one and sets the Z bit if it's zero. Increment F subtracts one and sets the Z bit if it's zero. And then you have inclusive OR, which is a standard OR. W with F. And again, in all these, you can leave the result either in the file register referenced or in the W register with that single D bit. And then you have move W to F and uh, rotate left F through carry, rotate right F through carry. So these are rotates. So you have, uh, so you take whatever's in the carry bit and it rotates in and whatever rotates out goes to the carry bit and you're shifting everything either left or right, depending. Uh, and then you can, and then you have the subtract, subtract W from F and then subtract with borrow. The borrow just means to use the carry bit too. So if you did a 16 bit subtract, you do it the same way you do the add. You do the, the first, you do this W from F first and then you would do the second byte you do it uh, with borrow. Okay, and then we have um, then we have swap swap nibbles in F. Now, people sometimes try and use this swap instruction to exchange one byte for another byte, but it doesn't work that way. You only have one location referenced, and you can only leave the result in that location or the W register. What it does, it looks goes to that location, looks at those eight bits, 
It takes the lower four bits and replace and puts them where the upper four bits were, takes the upper four bits and puts them where the lower four bits were. So you're really, you're not swapping bytes, you're swapping nibbles. You're only swapping four bits within the same eight bit location. And then exclusive R. So you have all that you have and R, exclusive R, you have add, subtract, complement, uh, increment, decrement, swap nibbles, rotates, arithmetic shift uh, right, and logical shift left and right. And the reason logical shift left and arithmetic shift left are the same. So that's why you only have the arithmetic shift right. <coughs> okay, so those are the byte oriented instructions. Notice in every one of these with, without, with, with the exception of the clears and the move, there's a, there's, there's a D bit that's located here. And that D bit specifies a single bit specifies whether it's going to go into the W or the file register. The, these bits up here, these bits are the opcode. And, and then the file register locations are the F bits. And the only where you, place you don't have that is when you're clearing W. And it's just a, it's a, it's, it's one of those instructions here that was opcode only. Okay, now you have these byte oriented skip operations. These are, these are what we're gonna use for our, for our assembly language for loop. We don't use the increment one very often. It's just harder to figure out, but we do use the decrement all the time for, for it to set up a little for loop in assembly language. So I'll go through that in a minute. We do, we do the bit oriented file register operations. These are really handy and they're not, they're not really available in C and C we have to use a mask, which is kind of a pain in the butt, but that's what we do. And, uh, but here we can just do these. And then finally, we have the, the bit oriented skip. Now notice here, you have the file register and you don't have a D bit, you've got a B bit here and that B is a three bit, one, two, three, three bits right here. Those three bits right there. And those three bits tell which bit in that eight, in that eight bit location is gonna be affected. And the same thing, bit clear F, bit set F. You've used that instruction already. So you can do port A uh, comma five and you're gonna affect bit five. Port A comma two, you're gonna affect the, the blue LED. So that's how that works. And then when you do bit test F skip clear, bit test F skip set, it checks that bit. It doesn't change anything, but it just it just looks at that bit specified by B and the location specified by F. And if it's if it's clear, it'll skip the next instruction in this instruction. If in this one, if it's set, it'll skip the next instruction. So what that allows you to do is to create loops that that basically pull on that bit. So we we call that pulling on a bit. And it's a, usually a tight loop that just checks the bit and keeps looping until the bit changes. Um, okay, and then we have the literal operations. These are the important ones to really understand uh, as well. And, and there's, so there's two of them that are kind of goofy here. There's the MOVLB, that's move literal to the BSR. That is what, when you write a bank cell instruction, the bank cell, the compiler creates an, an, an MOVLB instruction in response to that bank cell compiler directive to put the right bank for the variable you specify into the BSR. So if you say bank cell uh, latch A, L-A-T-A, it, 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 the compiler knows what bank latch A is in and it puts that bank number in this MOVLB instruction and writes an MOVLB uh, three, I think. I think it's bank three. The other one is this PC laugh thing, which we're never gonna use, but that's what you would use if you, if you had to do a big jump, you could set it up by first preloading the PC lat, lat, latch high, the program counter latch high, and then you can write the lower eight bits of the program counter. This, this is only seven bits, not eight, because at the PC lath is only seven bits. That's because the lower is eight bits, the upper is seven bits, and the program counter is only 15 bits because your maximum program size uh, in this family of, of chips is 32K and that's 15 bits. Uh, so that's why it's only a 15 bit 
Uh, that's why the, the, the latch high is only seven bits. And then, then the one we knew we use all the time is this move literal to W. And that references an eight bit literal here K. K is eight bits. And uh, you actually put the data in here and that eight bits of data then gets loaded, loaded in the W when this instruction is executed. So it's basically a way to put a constant into your working register. Um, and then you can, there, there are actually um, some logical instructions. You can add a literal to the W register. You can and a literal with the W register. And of course, you're always going to leave the results. In this case, the data is in this instruction. It's, it's here in this K and the results always going to be left in W. So you can add, you can and, you can or, you can exclusive or, and you can subtract. Or you can just put a literal into W. Okay, so those are the main instructions. And the only other thing you have to know about are some of these branch instructions, the call instruction, the go-to instruction, return from interrupt instruction. Uh, and then uh, these are a few others. Uh, clear the watchdog timer, no op. Uh, this option and sleep, uh, this option and TRIS or legacy you can ignore those. Reset and sleep. And then finally, uh, these are the C compiler optimized instructions. We really don't ever have to deal with them. Uh, but the C compiler uses those all the time. Okay, so that's the instruction set. You go ahead, question? Yeah, uh, where do you use the no operation? Like, what is it? What does the no op do? Yeah, like where do we even use it? Because if there's no operation, we can just like skip it, kind of. Yeah, so it's 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 really helpful to have that instruction uh, when you're when you're doing one a couple different things. One, sometimes you're writing code and you and you know you need an instruction there. You're not quite sure what it's going to be yet, so you can put it in a no op as a placeholder, uh, and your code will still compile and everything. Uh, sometimes you can put a no op in when you want to you want to. Uh, basically not change that you, you, you might be writing a loop where you have critical timing. Like if you just need a little teeny delay, like when you change the channel in the, uh, <clears throat> when you change the channel in the A to D converter, you need to wait about, a, you need to wait a, a few uh, microseconds to uh, or actually maybe a few nanoseconds uh, before you go on. And uh, you need to give the, the sampling capacitor time to charge up before you start the conversion. And so sometimes you can just do a no op instruction and that puts in a microsecond. If you're running at four megahertz, then that's that adds one microsecond of delay. And maybe you could put in three no ops, give you three microseconds if you needed that. Sometimes we'll use them in, in timing loops where we, we need to create a very specific amount of delay, but we wanna do it you know, just in just and in the instruction execution time uh, so in our case, with, four, with the clock at four megahertz, our instruction execution time is one microsecond. So every no op is going to add a microsecond of, of time, uh, delay time. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. So there's places where it's useful to have it. Uh, and th this, is in, this is an instruction that sometimes is, we have the ability, when we start writing our C program, we can actually embed assembly language instructions into our C routine. We call it inline assembly language programming. And sometimes you'll see people will embed a no op instruction just to get a one microsecond or in the case of a four megahertz clock or whatever clock they're running, give a real short delay. Sometimes they'll do that uh, because it's just the most efficient way to put in that teeny delay. Otherwise, in anything else you do in C, it's gonna, it's gonna, be, a little, it's gonna be a little more complicated. Although C has a, C has a compiler directive that's really nice called the uh, underscore underscore delay underscore uh, mic, uh, US uh, and then in parenthesis you put the number of microseconds you want to delay. So you can do that too. Okay. All right. Well, anyway, okay. So let me now, let's now go. We'll take a few minutes and, and uh, I'll do a little, I'll do some coding and then I'll probably come back and, uh, and do this, uh, do some more next week. Um, on Monday, I'll probably do some more, maybe Tuesday, because uh, I, I don't think right now there's there's not a lecture for Tuesday, so I'll probably do one. Okay, so so first off, I, so I want to do I want to do the uh, I want to do code for a uh, 
for basically an assembly language. for loop. So we'll do that. And then I want to I want to change exchange uh, contents of two locations in memory. Or in, I'll say RAM in random access memory. So we'll have location A and loca or location X and Y, and we'll take whatever's in X and put it in Y and whatever's in Y and put it in X. And we, we usually use a scratch pad to do that, like another location Z uh, to make it easier, but you can actually do it without another location using exclusive ORs. But anyway, we, we, we probably won't do it that way. We'll do it the, the straightforward way. And then we're gonna pull on a bit And then we'll we'll configure a register, a register, a a, a a special function register. So these are the four main functions I want you to be able to do: uh, do the for loop, exchange the contents of two locations, pull on a bit, and configure a special function register. So I, I probably I'll, I'll I'll do the assembly language for routine now. And then I'll come back and do the other uh, on Friday, or I'm sorry, on Monday. Okay. All right. So, so let's look at this. So, so our basic structure for our, our assembly language routine is, um, and I think I'm going to use a pen on this. It might be easier to see. Let's see if this is better. Maybe. This is good. Okay, so the first thing we have to do, we taught several steps. First, we have to uh, preload our, our, uh, our index. This is basically equivalent to saying, uh, if we have a for loop, k equals zero. So this is equivalent to that. And then, then we're going to set up. Um, then we we set up the loop. So that's going to be that's going to be the uh, say k less than ten. And um, <clears throat> and then we also have to have k plus plus. And that's. This also does that too. And then we do the contents of the loop. Just like in a for loop, we have our we have our curly braces here and our contents. And we have our curly brace here. So so that's we're gonna do exactly this in assembly language. Same, same exact thing. So the first thing we do is we set up our index. So in this case, we'll let's we'll define we'll we'll do uh, we'll do define we'll just, we'll say k and we'll give it a location of say um, <clears throat> uh, 0x, um, zero x um, zero thirty. So we'll just put that, or maybe actually maybe we'll put it in. Uh, 0x, zero, uh, zero uh, f, 0. So we'll put it in our, what's called the common RAM. Now, now that common RAM, let's just take one quick minute and look at the data sheet. That common RAM, uh, if we pull this up and we go to our memory organization, Uh, and we go down here and we look at uh, we look at our banks. So here's here's a standard our, our standard memory bank setup, the core function registers, special function registers, general purpose, and the common RAM. 
And if we look at that, that common RAM is actually here in the very, very first, in this very first uh, bank. So, and then it's mapped to every other bank. It's the same seven zero hex to seven F hex, every bank, every bank, every bank, and every bank. So it doesn't matter where the BSR is pointing. If we put it in this common RAM up here, seven zero to seven F hex, then it, it'll be fine. And remember 12 bits of address, right? So three hex digits covers the whole thing. And this is zero hex, zero seven zero to zero seven F. So that's the whole common RAM. Now, if we put it in, in any of these other uh, 80 bytes here, 80 bytes here, 80 bytes here, we have to be in the right bank. And if you add this all up, 80 bytes for here, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80 plus 80, 80, 80, 80, and plus 48, and plus the 16 common RAM bytes. So that is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 times 80 plus 48 plus 16. So let's do that just for grins. We'll pull up the calculator. Uh, crap. And what I, let's see, what I, how many times 80 did I say? You might remember. 12. 12. So that gives us 960 plus 48 in the last in this bank in bank 12 it wasn't a whole 80 so just 48 here so plus 48 plus 16 and what does that give us 1024 1k of ram that's how it's divided up now if you wanted to put <coughs> let's say 500 bytes in a continual in a continual uh, an array, you have to use indirect addressing to do that because otherwise it'd be spaced across here. It'd be a real pain to have to be keep changing the BSR to get to the right place. And that's why indirect addressing is available. It lets us do that. So there are some times when even in assembly language, you have to use indirect addressing. And of course, C only uses indirect addressing because it's, it, it, it's just, that's just how it does it. Uh, so there are some advantages to indirect addressing. But, uh, but for most of our smaller programs, we don't have to do that. And you can use indirect addressing in assembly language, but anyway, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna avoid that. Okay. Let's see, um, here. Okay, so, so we're gonna set this then in common RAM at zero F zero, the first location in that common RAM. And that's just so we don't have to do a BSR. Now that's, that takes care of, of this part, we've, 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 we've created our index, but we haven't preloaded it. So now we're, we're in, the, in the case of the for loop, we start to zero and count up usually, but in the case of the assembly language for loop, we're gonna start with our, with our uh, limit and count down. So the next thing we do, so we do this up here in the, in the non-program part of our, our code, but down here somewhere in the, in the setup part of our code, we're gonna, <coughs> initialize K. So we'll do M O V literal to W and we'll do, uh, we'll do uh, 10. Now you have to remember if we do 10, you have to be careful because zero X one zero equals 16, whereas 10 equals 10 in base 10, whereas this is base 16. So you have to make sure you keep that straight. So we're going to load 10 into W and then we're gonna move W to F and we'll specify, uh, since we put it in common RAM, we don't have to do a BSR. We'll put K and it'll take, that's one of the bio-oriented instructions where we don't have to have the second operand because it's always gonna take W and put it in F. So there's no point in having a choice of W or F. So we're gonna move W to F and we're gonna put that 10, first it goes into W and then from W it goes into K. And everything we do works like that. We always go through W to move things around. All right, now K equals the value, it has the value 10 stored at its location, but its location is actually zero F zero hex. All right, 
And remember, we couldn't put 500 in here because it's only eight bits. So the max we can put in is 120 uh, is uh, is uh, 256 if it's unsigned. And if it's signed, the max we could put in is minus 128 to plus 127 because it's only it's only eight bits. So that's the smallest and biggest you can fit in eight bits in two's complement. All right. Now this gets us. Now this gets us. K equals not zero, but K equals 10, and we're going to decrement. All right. Now, now we write our loop. We have to have a name for our loop, so we'll call it loop one, loop one. And then we have some instruction here at loop one. Uh, I'll put a no op in just to kind of as a placeholder. But obviously, we want to do something. So I'll put some no ops in. So somewhere we come back and we actually put some steps we want to repeat 10 times here. Then, now if we were using, if K were in any bank besides the common RAM, we'd have to do a bank cell down here. But since it's in common RAM, we don't have to. So now we're just going to do a decrement, decrement, DEC, F, skip on zero. So the the, the F we're going to decrement is K, our index register. And we're going to store the result in K, because otherwise, when we decrement it, we're going to leave the result in W, and K will still be 10, so we're never going to we'll be in this loop forever. And then the next instruction after this is our branch back to loop. So we can do a BRA or a go to. Now, if the loop were huge, we'd have to do a go to. And if it was even huger than that, then we'd be in a little bit of trouble. We'd have to wrangle this around a little bit. But normally, we're never going to exceed uh, a go to. And usually, a BRA is fine. I probably should have gone to go to. It doesn't matter. So what that's going to do is we go through here, and we're going to branch back to here. But, but if when we decrement k, if it gets to 0, we're going to skip over and go to the next instruction here, which will continue with the rest of our program. And that is that is the test here. And it's also not the increment, but it's it's k minus minus effectively. It's, it's the decrement. And so the way this works, the first time we go through the loop, k equals 10. We get down here and we subtract 1. Now k equals 9, but it's not 0, so we branch. So that's our first time through. That's first. The next time through, k equals 9, we decrement it, and now it's 8, and that's our second time through. Next time through, it's 8, we decrement it, and now it's 7, that's our third time through. And it's 7 to 6, fourth, 6 to fifth, fifth, fifth to fourth, um, so that's our sixth, fourth to, to third, that's our seventh, third to second, that's our eighth, second to first, that's our ninth. And then last time, it's first to zero. And that's our tenth. When that happens, it is zero now. We'll skip, and we drop out of the loop. So that's how we loop 10 times. Now, if we wanted to loop 15 times, we just put 15 here instead. Now, we, we have to do this setup function every time we're going to execute the loop. So if we come back and do the loop again, we have to set it up again. OK? And that's the way to do it. So if you put in 15, you would execute the loop 15 times. If you put in 25, you'd execute it 25 times. Because we only have 8 bits, we can only the maximum we can only do is 256 times. Well, 255 times. You can't, you can't do 256. Just 255. Well, that's actually not quite true. If you put zero in the location, the first time through it would decrement it and it would turn to 255. And so that would, then the result wouldn't be zero. So you actually could do it 256, but you'd have to put zero in to the value, which was a little confusing. So you can think 255 is going to be the biggest, but you could actually get 256 out of it. It just, 
you know, it just, it would make your code hard to understand though. Uh, people would go zero, how's that gonna work? And then they'd have to figure out, oh, it's gonna decrement it first and then test it. Okay, I think with that, um, so I think that hopefully gives you, um, that hopefully gives you a good, a good sense of how to do the assembly language for loop. So I'll do the other, I'll do those other things uh, on, I'll do a little zoom. I'll do it in the uh, help session on Monday, I think is what I'll do. Uh, although I have a dental appointment, so uh, at one, so I, I, my help session is gonna be screwed up a little bit on Monday, but I'll, uh, I'll probably, I'll, I'll probably get through that. I may do, I may do another one even Tuesday, we'll see. But, uh, but for sure, I'll, I'll, I'll be online at noon on Monday and uh, hopefully uh, we'll get through some more of this then. And if not, I'll finish it up on Tuesday. But I have covered this in the lectures as well. All right, any questions? Um, I was gonna ask, so is the exam timed? And is there like specific time we have to log in and stuff? Or it's just sometimes throughout the day? You can start at any time you want. Once you start it, you'll have a limited amount of time to do it, like probably 90 minutes or something, okay. which, which should be plenty. And it's, okay. and it's open book. So you should be able to figure it out. So like it's like the MCQs on Blackboard, like the Blackboard quiz? Yeah, it'll be on Blackboard. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, I, well, yeah, I think so. Yeah, it'll be on Blackboard. I forget how I did it. Uh, no, I, I have to look. So I may, I may, there may be questions about it. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I did have you just write the code. I don't know. I'll see. Can't remember now. I have to look. Forgot. That's fine. Yeah, I, I don't know. I'll let you know on Monday. I'll look at it. All right, any other question? What about configuring uh, GPIO digital input? Will we, we have to do that on the exam? Yeah, because we'll pull on a bit. So I'll probably set that up as a GPIO that you have to configure. Uh huh. And then you okay, have to pull you. on it. Mm -hmm. We'll go over that. Yeah. Yeah, we have to, of course, for that, you have to do the Ansel bits. You have to do, you have to make it an input. So you have to do the, you have to do the Tris register, the Ansel register. And, uh, and then it's probably a good idea to go ahead and, and uh, clear the bit in the latch register. And then you have to use the port register to read it because the latch register won't help you with the input. Okay. Uh, I think you covered that on lecture seven. I'll just go over that again. And then mm -hmm. I'll tune in on Monday as well. For okay. clarification. Yeah, that's probably a good plan. Right, yeah. Thank you, Professor. Okay, no problem. All right, so we'll we'll stop it here, and uh, I'll see you guys maybe on Monday. Thank you.